as most of you know, we saw 40x standard deviation events starting in uh, very early to mid March associated with a significant rise in initial claims for unemployment benefits as employers moved employees off of their direct payrolls and onto those that were established by the government through multiple stimulus acts that were created in the wake of the pandemic. We saw a peak in initial claims in late March and early April of around 7 million people letting the government know that they had either lost their job permanently or temporarily. Since then, we've seen a quote flattening of that curve. And uh, in the weekend of June 6th, we noted that 1.5 million people told the government that they had lost their job. Clearly, we've seen a very significant decline in the number of people that are moving off of payrolls. And this is an interesting timing because um, it's coming at a point where we have seen the significant majority of states reopen their economies. Uh, as of yesterday, only three states remain unopened, and those three states are partially reopening. California, Oregon, and Tennessee uh, are in some state uh, of reopening, and so even states like New York, which are very large from an employment and population standpoint, have made significant gains in allowing businesses to reopen and for employers to move furloughed workers back onto payroll. As a result of that shift, uh, what we have also noticed is that the number of people reporting continuing claims of unemployment has really plateaued over the last four to five weeks. Looking at the blue line here, we note that uh, in late April, roughly 20 million people was the maximum number across the United States that were experiencing prolonged unemployment in the wake of the pandemic. And that number has since dipped below 20 million. We believe that as states continue to reopen and businesses uh, are able to achieve something uh, more closely aligned to full stabilization of capacity, for example, at restaurants and bars, that we'll see this continuing claims number decline. The total number of people that will remain uh, furloughed or laid off indefinitely remains to be seen, but it's very promising and important to see that this number has plateaued. Given that we've been shifting our focus to continuing claims as opposed to initial claims, we've also altered the way that we present this data on a state basis. As many of you who have attended these presentations in the past may recall, it was states like Kentucky and Georgia that used to be some of the outlier states when we were looking at the total number of jobs that had been impacted as a percentage of the total employment that those states had achieved prior to the pandemic. Shifting our focus, we see that Georgia is now in the middle of uh, page six, signifying that many of the people whose jobs were impacted in the state of Georgia have ostensibly been able to come back onto a payroll that they had uh, been forced off of. Meanwhile, it's states like Michigan and Nevada and Oregon, which are now experiencing a stubborn unemployment rate as measured by continuing claims. You'll also notice that New York and California are off the graph here. And the reason for that is uh, you know, given their relatively high number of continuing claims, we wanted to allow the, the viewer to see some better spacing between the dots that are at the bottom left hand side of the page on this graph. And those are the markets that are experiencing a relatively small amount of impact on a continuing basis. Markets like <clears throat> Missouri, Arizona, Washington DC, and Utah are performing relatively well, well relative to uh, markets of their peer size. And given that some of these markets are, are not experiencing as high a continuing rate of unemployment, we would expect that commercial real estate fundamentals would perform better versus markets that uh, are at the top of the page here or further to the right. We continue to look at information on a zip code level basis, and we continue to see that there is a very strong correlation between per capita income at the zip code level and the likelihood for unemployment to be very high in that zip code. We're encouraging all of our investor clients and landlords to focus on zip codes that would be towards the towards the horizontal, uh, the bottom horizontal line on this graph and focusing as far to the right as possible uh, in terms of trying to chase markets that uh, are better set to achieve outperformance uh, for the foreseeable future. With markets reopening and uh, 
previously unemployed employees coming back onto payrolls, what we've seen is a, a fairly sharp rebound in the number of jobs that are being added to payrolls. In the first week after the end of May, the Bureau of Labor Statistics told us that the U.S. added 2.5 million jobs uh, in the month of May. That's that kind of employment growth is usually um, is usually achieved over the course of an entire year, not in an individual month. And it wasn't all that surprising to see that many of the jobs that were added back uh, came back strongest in the markets that experienced the biggest decline. And uh, unfortunately, the legend here is cut off on this page, but leisure and hospitality had lost 8.8 .8 million jobs uh, prior, since before the pandemic and gained back 1.5 million in the month of May alone. You might see uh, also here towards the left hand side of the page that construction was the next strongest uh, uh, sector that added jobs back in the month of May, having added about 600,000 jobs. You know, underneath these super sectors, we have uh, smaller sections which uh, show that there is a little bit of a rebound. So the strongest rebound came in restaurants and bars, and that makes sense to us as many of those types of businesses were allowed to reopen broadly across the United States. And while this is a sharp rebound, it isn't necessarily a perfect symmetrical V-shaped recovery, but we definitely wanted to see this type of snapback, and we hope that uh, the June employment report will uh, continue to show that millions of uh, previously laid off or furloughed employees were able to come back onto payroll. It's very important to see these businesses, especially in leisure and hospitality, um, add employees back because it'll send a good signal about what we can expect for second quarter GDP when those numbers are printed uh, in uh, the middle of July. As you may recall, <clears throat> in the first quarter, uh, personal consumption declined by the highest rate on record, and that's a fairly elastic category. So we hope that that will snap back and uh, and, and give uh, economists and investors enough confidence to uh, not only hire people and bring them back onto payroll, but also to lease space and um, and allow the commercial real the commercial real estate investment community to have a greater level of confidence about the trajectory of property fundamentals going forward. Speaking of property valuations, we continue to see the REIT market um, hovering at a correction of around 25%. That's obviously um, much more advantageous than the initial 45% decline in REIT valuations that, uh, that we experienced in the immediate wake of the onset of the pandemic. On a property type basis, industrial and data center type REITs continue to outperform. And what's interesting to us is that over the past couple of weeks, the office REIT sector has really experienced a significant decline in valuations. We attribute this to some of the comments that technology companies such as Twitter and Facebook have recently made relative to extending their work from home uh, <clears throat> plans for their employees. But we haven't necessarily seen a big decline in uh, leasing demand or uh, a prolonged problem in, in terms of rent collections with office landlords. So. For now, we think that this is merely a short-term public valuation problem and that this will normalize, but we'll continue to take, uh, take an acute focus on that going forward. In terms of the private market, we haven't seen forecast uh, change materially with Moody's predicting that their commercial property price index will see roughly a 20% decline in private real estate valuations through the end of this year and then needing the greater part of an additional 24 months to fully recover and we we expect that uh, retail and lodging properties would perform more poorly than this average and we would also expect that industrial and residential would perform better than average <clears throat> looking into uh, the specific property types we're starting to take a look at some traditional data metrics and some new ones in order to to determine what's going on on the ground google and apple have each uh, been uh, very generous in providing mobility data to market participants. And on this page, we're taking a look at grocery store visits by pedestrians and, and shoppers as a percentage of the pre-pandemic baseline. And the way to read this is that the orange line representing the District of Columbia shows that there's about a 25% um, uh, decline still in the number of people that are visiting grocery stores in that locale. Whereas in markets such as Georgia, 
and Texas uh, and Illinois, we're seeing a restoration of visits to grocery stores. We're going to try to take a more acute focus uh, of this data in MSAs like New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, Dallas, etc. And the supposition by many is that the more urban markets will experience the prolonged declines that the District of Columbia is exhibiting here. But we're not all we're not we're not all that sure that that's going to be the case. One of the interesting things that we've also noted uh, is that we've seen a very large increase in the number of people who are willing to purchase their groceries online and either pick them up in stores or have them delivered to their home. <clears throat> One of the biggest segments for the increase in this type of shopping segment is among baby boomers, two thirds of whom have started shopping for groceries online and 75% of whom report uh, such a satisfactory experience that they continue to make online grocery shopping part of their permanent grocery habits. This certainly would be taking away from uh, grocery store visits in person. Uh, and again, we'll be looking at that on a more specific geographic basis going forward. But overall, we continue to see that uh, retail sales remain below pre-pandemic levels. Uh, for those of you that have seen this graph before, you'll remember that the blue bars here represent February sales and the gray bar represents the change that took place in May. Overwhelmingly, sale losses in restaurants and bars continue to outpace gains made inside grocery and liquor stores. However, uh, we're starting to see some improvement in other categories where the news is, quote, less bad. Take, for example, vehicle uh, sales, auto parts and gas stations, where we were seeing very significant multi-billion dollar declines in excess of 15 billion. Those losses have been paired significantly. And in addition, non-store retail continues to grow very palpably and is the highest segment in terms of percentage growth in sales uh, since February. Some of the other categories such as furnishings and electronics and clothing, items that represent uh, either elective expenses or high cost expenses continue to exhibit some pretty draconian declines, but those are smaller segments. And overall, retail sales were down about 16% at the end of uh, March and 15% at the end of March and April, and those declines have been pared back to roughly 8%. So as we continue to see uh, improvement in retail sales, which is evidenced by the, the V-shaped recovery in, in total sales here last month, we see a super acceleration of an ongoing trend in the adoption of e-commerce. Thinking about that adoption, we, can, we expect that certain markets will continue to benefit from momentum from logistics leasing demand. The orange arrows here represent the percentage of availability that certain markets have been able to absorb in the year that led up to the end of March. Um, take, for example, Chicago and Dallas-Fort Worth. Chicago uh, at the end of March had roughly 125 million square feet of uh, industrial availability in its market, and in the year leading up to that had absorbed about 10% of that space. Whereas Dallas-Fort Worth had absorbed uh, roughly 30 to 40% of their 100 million uh, square feet of industrial space. So as we look across these markets and we think about all the property that's being developed and delivered to the market, you know, we certainly think that broadly logistics is going to be a winner, but some markets uh, are going to be stronger than others just based on the amount of construction that's been underway and will continue to be delivered in these locales. Thinking about leasing activity in the industrial market, we clearly saw a dip in late March and early April. Uh, but leases, according to CoStar, have resumed normal business. And um, while we haven't seen the number of leases broach the 600 uh, figure that we saw kind of typically um, pre-pandemic, what we are seeing is um, a, a very solid bottom uh, again in late March, early April, and then a very, a very significant and consistent increase uh, off that bottom, which is you know important from a momentum and underwriting standpoint. But I want to come back to the subject matter of availability of delivered space. Over the past several years, developers have um, been very eager to lean into the e-commerce trend. And when we look at the amount of square footage in the industrial market that has been delivered over the past few years and how much of it has been leased, we see that there's a lot of excess capacity that needs to be taken up. So uh, and as much as we're excited about the increase in demand for logistics space, 
and the increase in leasing um, that we're starting to see as green shoots in the market, we hope that it will take up all the slack uh, that's evidenced by page 21 fairly quickly. And with that, we'll move to the multifamily market. Broadly speaking, rent collections remain really healthy, much better than most investors anticipated they may be. Nationwide, average collections through the 20th of May was roughly 91% and very similar to performance reported in May of 2019. Preliminary June numbers uh, through the 13th point to uh, very healthy rent collection levels in June as well. When we're looking at these types of collections from an MSA standpoint, the larger markets in the country are, are doing quite well and the percentage declines um, are, are not very bad and only a handful of markets have experienced declines in excess of uh, 5%. Those markets are at the very far right-hand side uh, of the page that you're looking at here. What is interesting, however, is what's going on with asking rents. And uh, here we provide some very interesting analysis from CoStar, which they presented last week as part of their market analytics presentation, looking at some of the coastal markets in the Northeast, in the Mid-Atlantic, and along the California coastline, What's noticeable here is that the larger core multifamily markets have experienced sharper corrections in asking rental rates than some of their smaller cousins in nearby locations. So as an example, Los Angeles and Orange County at the bottom right here have experienced about a 2% decline in asking rental rates overall year to date, whereas their uh, smaller neighbors, Inland Empire and San Diego, have not experienced such a, such a significant decline. What's going to be interesting, of course, is not just what's going on with asking rents, but uh, where the signed leases are taking place in multifamily properties. Many markets are accustomed to operating uh, in an environment of landlord concession. Take, for example, my native Houston, Texas, whereas many other markets are not. And so effective rental rates are gonna be very interesting to watch relative to what's happening with asking rental rates, which are evidenced on this page. And as we continue to uh, give you updates to this presentation. We'll start to incorporate effective rents uh, month by month. Moving to the office market, unfortunately, we haven't seen uh, a solid bottom in leasing activity. We see a similar decline in leasing that we saw in industrial, but without the significant and uh, consistent rebound. And with what we're seeing in Trans Western's leasing pipeline, the majority of executions are tilted towards renewals as opposed to new organic leases or expansions uh, of space and, and moves, which is understandable given how many tenants are still in a wait and see approach to organizing their own businesses and understanding when they can reopen and normalize operations within their own company. As we provided in the industrial market, uh, we provide in the office market a look at uh, just how much square footage is available. In this case, we decided to take a look at sublet availability, which hasn't really increased in meaningful measure over the past two months, but certain markets certainly have more than others. And the change in sublet availability is interesting uh, in markets like New York and San Francisco leading into the pandemic. So we'll be looking to see how these trends change uh, over the next couple of months as tenants get a firm grasp of how their use of space is going to change uh, and what impact that has uh, on, their, uh, on their current uh, locations across the country. But within uh, all these MSAs, another debate that has definitely arisen is what will happen in terms of demand for space in urban environments versus suburban markets. And, um, you know, looking back through previous cycles and expansions and, and declines, what is interesting to us is that suburban submarkets have always had an easier time absorbing availability whether the market is expanding or contracting. And even during the financial crisis, suburban markets in aggregate never recorded negative net absorption. Uh, and through the resulting expansion, had an easier time um, taking up slack uh, from companies that uh, ostensibly were looking for more affordable um, spaces to house their corporations. And when you add in the added layer of consideration that many businesses are gonna be overly considerate about committing to higher cost, higher density space in urban environments. This trend may uh, expand uh, going into uh, the post-pandemic environment. 
with that, I'm going to turn the call over for Capital Markets to Steve Pumper, and uh, we'll finish with Q&A. Steve, go ahead. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Um, what we're seeing in the marketplace right now is that deal flip is starting to pick up. Given the amount of capital raised recently by investors, coupled with loosening in the debt markets, uh, a rebound in the stock market, and the reopening of the country, it appears that sellers are beginning to slowly list properties and increase the request for BOVs. Now, the critical element of that is the, the price discovery. It's still going to pose a major obstacle. Deals transacting is a divide between the seller and the buyer's expectation. It, it's still um, quite significant. And in my mind, private buyers will continue to the way on the transactional activity. We're looking at uh, and hoping that we can get foreign investors and 1031 exchange buyers to come in and expand that buying pool because for the most part, institutional investors remain patient and they're waiting for additional data points to be revealed. One of the things that we're seeing holding up throughout this entire process is the single tenant net lease deals. And as we're kind of looking at where we are today versus a year ago, the single tenant net lease volume has held up quite well. It's, it's trailing last year by uh, single digits, but um, obviously the retail sector is getting hammered in that uh, space disproportionately. But uh, factories, R&D, and distribu uh, distribution facilities are doing really, really well. Um, let's go to the next slide. As we're talking about those in the market, there's some interesting things occurring. Um, Silverstein out of New York is pursuing the acquisition of the U.S. Bank Tower in downtown L.A. Uh, OU is a, a, out of Singapore, listed the project for, it's a million four square feet, and it was listed for um, a target price of 700 million, or roughly 500 bucks foot. And that was brought out in the first quarter of 19. The latest and greatest is that Silverstein's negotiating a price in the 425 to 450 million range, which would equate to roughly three to 320 bucks uh, a square foot, or roughly um, a 35 to 4 percent reduction over the initial target price. And just to be aware of it, the replacement cost on this asset is roughly 900 bucks a foot. Um, if completed, this trade be the largest in the country since the investment sales market locked up in March. So everybody's going to look at that. There's a few factors in this transaction that make it a little bit more difficult. Um, amid the concerns of social distancing, it's been extremely difficult to uh, pitch a tall office building with multiple tent sharing um, you know, elevator banks. And the building's 72 stories high. It's one of the uh, tallest buildings in the western part of the US. The other key element is there's a big revenue factor from the bank tower. Um, they have a lot of tourists who come there for their sky space, which is located on the top floors. They have a restaurant, observation deck, and an exterior uh, reports glass slide. Um, and that area is obviously been closed since March. So hopefully that deal will close uh, within the next few months and provide a great data point for investors around the country as they're looking for the price discovery. Another deal we're looking at is up in Seattle. Senska is in the market quietly um, shopping a newly built uh, skyscraper valued at over 700 million. The building is 103,000 square feet and they're targeting 1,000 bucks a foot. And that would basically tie the record for the highest per square foot value in Seattle history. Now the interesting part of it is Skanska is considering retaining a minority stake in the building roughly 10 to 20 percent. And if you look at it, 703,000 square feet, 17,000 square feet of that is retail, and the 686,000 square feet of that are comprised of four tenants, uh, Qualtrics, Dropbox, Indeed, and Spaces, which is a co-working concept. And they have weighted average uh, lease term of eight years. So that will be another interesting data point. Uh, see how that comes together. And the intention of Scanga is to close that deal by year end. Then I kind of wanted to look around the country for just a few other things that would show the deal flow is starting to go forward. And I, I found two deals up in the Boston area. 
One's a single tenant lease deal um, with Moderna being the major tenant there. Um, and Moderna, obviously, one that is uh, being considered one of five companies to come up with a vaccine uh, to get coronavirus. Uh, the building's a 15 year old net lease in Norwood, Mass, 243,000 uh, square feet. And their target pricing is 101 million to roughly 416 bucks a foot, which would probably equate to about 5.7 cap rate. And this is or the reason I put this out there is it's the first sizable listing that has been brought out in the Boston area since the pandemic. And then another one that's out in the market just came out is in Waltham in the Davis companies with um, P. Jim and Marcus Partners have a three building office complex for 515,000 square feet out in Waltham in the suburbs. Um, it's a three building office complex, but it has the potential to be converted lab space and appeal to life science tenants. So I think that's gonna uh, draw a lot of interest from buyers as we look at that. And then um, I'll shoot down to DC, two new listings that have hit the market there, 1129 20th Street Northwest, Pearl Lodge is, is bringing that out. They acquired when they bought Liberty Property Trust. And finally, 1730 M Street, JG's a seller, and they've just brought that to mark. Um, if you want to kick to the next slide, please. So we're talking about cap rates, price discovery. And um, interesting to see what's going on out there. And we, it's just too early to tell. And I think as you come out with some of these more core type assets in these niche plays where there's a lot of capital pursuing these types of deals, you'll start to have a better appreciation where pricing is. If you talk about the fundraising side of the business, in early April, and I mentioned this on the last call, there were 939 commercial real estate funds worldwide in the market for fundraising. And they were targeting a record $297 billion, and that was according to Frequent. And at that point in time, I mentioned it, Kane Anderson raised a billion three in two weeks and shut down the fund. Normally, it would take them 12 to 18 months to achieve that. So that was a pretty interesting deal. And then recently, it was announced last week, Rock Point Group just raised $5.8 million for two of their separate funds that they're going to be out in the market with. So the fundraising efforts continue, and it appears to me that the focus is still on the core and the opportunistic strategies is where they're trying to place that capital. You want to look at the next slide, please? If we're talking about the debt market, um, one of the interesting things I focused on because it's a little easier to track is the multifamily debt market. And Fred Mac, uh, Mac came out with an update and they said that inflows are near pre-COVID levels with acquisition financing come back to around 25% of their business. In the first two weeks of June, $8 million of loan requests were submitted to Freddie. And that is uh, really on a par with the pre pre-pandemic uh, levels they were seeing. In addition to that, the debt service requirements they were utilizing were reduced, so it was requiring less upfront um, equity for their acquisitions. And then the final thing within the space that they kind of cited is that, you know, with rent collections, and Jimmy alluded to it earlier, covering around 90% during this period of time, coupled with the May jobs report, which was much better than, than expected, they felt they're about where things were headed in the multifamily sector. And there's a couple of rules of thought on there because other people are looking at the multifamily sector and they're trying to gather more information regarding renters as to are they going to move back home? Are they going to double up? Um, one interesting thing is within the corporate leased units, many of them have stopped paying um, and, and, and jacked up some rent collections in that sector. So I think the corporate units within the multifamily sector, which have typically been in that class A space, are something we want to monitor and track going forward to see if that's kind of a temporary blip or if that actually has some legs going forward. Um, a final thing I would say is sellers are starting to ask grow funds in the first year to offset a potential drop off in rent collections. And then they're also trying to satisfy lending requirements, which were uh, being discussed as, as, as the lenders are trying to tighten things up. The final thing I'd say in the debt market is 
the banks and the life codes, they're taking care of their existing customers. They're starting to quote on deals, but they're still cautious moving forward. Next slide, Jeremy. Dry powder recap. Again, I think that people have been sitting around, they've been fairly bored. Uh, industrial tends to lead the way, but an interesting thing has come up. When you talk about um, industrial, uh, one of our clients mentions it's all about Amazon. And some lenders have reached their capacity in, with their exposure on Amazon. So they're looking at different ways they can play in that space. So Amazon is leading in the industrial sector. Logistics are a big portion. Food continues to be a strong sector in, in regard to that. And then if you look at the REO scenario in the CBS world, clearly lodging is leading it. Malls are big. The Mall of America just went into special servicing last week, which is fall in the U.S. Um, we're seeing more and more things happen in that area. And then we're starting to see office space trickle into that space. So we expect a lot of activity occurring in the special servicing space for the next, you know, three to five years, depending on the product type that you're looking at. And uh, with that, Jimmy, I'll throw it back to you. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to put some conclusions on the page here and then move to Q&A. And um, we really only have one question, which is, are we seeing companies uh, exhibit interest in moving from states with restrictive COVID quarantine to states that are more open? And my own personal observation is that I, I don't think that we've seen that yet. Um, and typically, those types of decisions uh, get motivated after the general population, i.e. The, the workforce, starts to move with their feet. Um, there was a really interesting article in this morning's edition of the Wall Street Journal that, that talked uh, about the movement of many people out of high-cost urban markets to nearby uh, lower-cost markets, although I have to say that that's not really a new trend. That's uh, an acceleration of an existing one, which is a common theme uh, that, that we continue to discuss in these presentations. There aren't really a whole lot of new trends that are coming out of the pandemic. It's more of an acceleration um, of things that uh, were already in fruition. Now, the one caveat um, to my answer is that uh, we are seeing that a very vocal business leader in Elon Musk is considering uh, opening uh, a new manufacturing plant outside uh, of Nevada and California, where he was previously uh, considering uh, housing that facility. So I have to say that's been in the news a lot, but it's really only one example, and we haven't seen any widespread um, trend-setting decisions that have been made at this point. Jimmy, how I'd answer that one, basically, the hub and spoke um, process, and I know you're familiar with it, has been talked about recently. And and it was um, brought on a ULI call a couple of weeks ago by Owen Thomas of Boston Properties. So I think there's a lot of credence to that uh, strategy, but it's early onset as to how they're underwriting it and utilizing it. So in major urban areas, areas, they would keep a core CD office space, but then they'd also buy places in the suburbs that, that people could go to. So if they needed to be in the core, they had office space there. Otherwise, they, they stay off mass transit and reduce their commutes and work from satellite offices in the edge city.